And um, it's a pleasure to introduce Andrei Brukno from STFC, who is going to share his presentation. So uh, he's going to start the presentation now. Yes, thank you, Edina. And uh, it, it is uh, a great pleasure to present at uh, this conference. And thank you very much for, to the organizers for allowing me to present my research. And let me now try to share it again. So this will be half pre-recorded uh, presentation with narrations, but then I will have to switch to videos. So halfway, I will switch to the videos and uh, then talk, leave. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrei Bruchno, and I'm going to present you a novel approach to multiscale simulation with accelerated fine detail dynamics coupled with coarse grain models. I work in computational chemistry group led by Ilian Todorov, SciTech Darsbury. As you may know, Darsbury village is located in Cheshire, and Cheshire is the motherland of a very well known girl, Alice, but most importantly, of Cheshire Cat. It is important for me because interscale modeling, as you probably will see later, follows Cheshire Cat's way of living. And I hope that by, by the end of this talk, you won't consider me as mad as most of the creatures in Lewis Carroll's novels. So let's start our adventure in the Wonderland with this nice representation of the grand scheme of multiscale modeling where we see that linkages are required between different levels of representation and, and, and uh, treatment, like going from quantum level to atomistic and molecular level, and all the way to molecular aggregates in the bulk solutions, and uh, then fully continuum representations for uh, flows and uh, similar phenomena. But the question is how to do that. For you to understand my motivation in developing the interscale methodology, in what follows, I am going to briefly represent existing systematic bottom-up coarse graining methodologies and the most important known issues uh, arising with coarse grain force fields. Uh, in particular, transferability in temperature, density, and concentration, and applicability of these coarse grain force fields to aggregation uh, phase separation and stability problems. I will give two instructive examples, in particular surfactants, which are smaller molecules and simpler to treat, and phospholipids, which have two tails, so more complicated cases. In the rest of my talk, I will, be, I will present my interscale simulation technique to combine uh, coarse grain and fine detail uh, representations in the same simulation, which I consider a viable alternative to hybrid, uh, hybrid scale models. The main concept behind systematic bottom-up coarse graining is to unite groups of atoms into coarse grain sites and provide effective interactions between them, thereby creating a coarse grain force field which uh, in simulation hopefully would reproduce average behavior and properties of the original uh, fine detail system. There is a bunch of known approaches to this, and I'm not going to go all, through all of them, uh, but for reasons uh, which will be apparent later, I will be focusing on structure fitting approaches, which are fully numerical approaches and aim to reproduce certain probability distribution functions as, as targets uh, so that uh, overall the coarse grain models would reproduce the structure in the simulation. I will also look a little bit at Martini models uh, which are obviously most popular nowadays and compare my uh, inter interscale simulation results with those. Uh, one note, 
uh, I prefer nowadays to use relative entropy minimization as uh, the means to optimize my coarse grain models. Talking about bottom-up coarse graining, I'd be mostly interested in structure feeding methodologies because they are supposedly better suited for optimizing coarse grain force fields to reproduce self-aggregation and self-assembly phenomena where the structure are, is important. So one starts with reference fine detail simulations. For complex molecules, it would be first of all a single molecule simulation in vacuum or solution, but eventually uh, a reference point uh, corresponding to a state point of interest would be performed and all these reference simulations would be relatively short, supposedly. Out of these reference simulations, one gets target distributions to fit against uh, when optimizing the coarse grain uh, model. And the whole iteration is uh, finished when some sort of merit function tells you to stop that the approximation is good enough. Uh, this way, the inverse Boltzmann iteration works and the inverse Monte Carlo iteration works and also relative entropy iteration works, although the math is different in all the three methods. And all these methods are available in Vodka package and you can follow this link for that. To illustrate the main issue with vodka type iteration for coarse graining, let us consider amphiphile molecules in solution, which can form quite different shapes uh, by self assembling. In this particular case, I present the equilibrium structure I obtained for the UPC uh, lipid molecules, where yeah, I started with bilayer structure and added extra lipid molecules at random position. Uh, around it, added water and ran United Atom Molecular Dynamics simulation for long enough to see what equilibrium structure I would get. Of course, radial distribution functions in each of these structures uh, would be quite different. So the question arises, what should I be using as my target distributions in order to be able to produce coarse grain force field to self-assemble in one of these structures or a mix of them? And the answer is it's uncertain. Another instructive example is surfactants in solution. In this case, I consider SDS surfactant, which is ubiquitous in washing liquids, for instance. Surfactants are known to readily self-assemble into micellar structures, provided the concentration is high enough. So what would one would think that it should be easy to see this micellization process in a molecular dynamics simulation, but apparently it's not the case and uh, full other molecular dynamics simulation takes way too long to see any uh, proper micelle forming. So this would be a nice case for coarse graining and accelerating that way uh, the molecular dynamics uh, for micellization. And I did actually try to run vodka iteration based on my relatively short reference full atom simulation in order to see if I will see the micellization in a coarse grain level. <clears throat> Unfortunately, because my target RDFs didn't correspond to any large aggregate, uh, the results I obtained with co in coarse grain molecular dynamics looked exactly the same statistically as what I saw in my full atom simulation. So after quite a few pretty much unsuccessful attempts to coarse grain amphiphiles in solution, I started thinking of ways how to take the best of both fine detail and coarse grain simulation worlds. And my idea was to somehow bridge between the full atom and coarse grain configuration spaces in the same simulation. And this aspect of the same simulation would perhaps allow me to enhance sampling of fine detail system uh, due to coupling with coarse grain dynamics at the same time. And one extra benefit would be if it was possible to on the fly optimize coarse grain force field in the same simulation by using, for instance, relative entropy 
a methodology. The snapshots on this slide illustrate the idea. Essentially, one starts with the fine detail representation, let's say full atom representation, and gradually transforms it into pure coarse grain representation, where water molecules or other small solvent molecules might be even missing, making it an implicit solvent coarse grain model. The question remains how to do this transformation efficiently. And after some consideration, I uh, decided to go with the so-called mixed Hamiltonian or Hamiltonian switch uh, method, which uh, uses Kirkwood coupling parameter approach uh, for transformation between two extreme Hamiltonian cases. And of course, we want to combine this Hamiltonian switch approach with the relative entropy minimization technique in order to constantly re-optimize coarse grain model, making it more and more fit to represent the fine detail uh, system. Before I turn to the Hamiltonian switch methodology, let me say a few words about relative entropy minimization. Relative entropy is an information theory measure of the lack of overlap between two probability distributions in a multidimensional space, like in our case. And uh, as crazy as it sounds, but one can estimate this lack of overlap. And so our aim is to minimize this lack of overlap in order to uh, optimize our coarse grain force field. And of course, the condition for minimizing relative entropy is that its derivatives with respect to each parameter in our coarse grain model should go to zero. There are actually two routes to relative entropy minimization. One of them is a direct thermodynamic route according to the uh, top formula on this slide. And the other one is uh, an arrangement of newton raphson iteration which both of which I'm using in the following. Hamiltonian switching is a very well-known simulation technique going under different names sometimes, like Kirkwood's coupling parameter or thermodynamic integration or mixed Hamiltonian. Most often it would be used for introduction of a large species like a molecule or gradually inserting a polymer in a polymer solution where, let's say, Weedham's insertion method won't work. Overall, it looks like it's a perfect match for our purposes of uh, transform, transforming between fine detail and coarse grain representations. But unfortunately, there is a catch, and the catch is related to the fact that fine detail Hamiltonian completely vanishes at the pure coarse grain end. And for that reason, the simulation would get stuck at the pure, pure coarse grain representation, not going back. Uh, towards the fine detail end. And uh, this is why I call this a uh, hard way or hard Hamiltonian switching. Despite what I said about the deficiency of the hard Hamiltonian switch, it is perfectly usable for mapping, let's say, between small molecular species like water uh, and uh, a one side coarse grain model. And on this slide, I show. Uh, my first test case where I reproduce a few points on the relative entropy diagram with respect to Ryan uh, Jones parameters fitting the SPC water model uh, as published in this paper by Scott Shell in 2008, which was the very first paper on relative entropy indeed. And as we can see, I was able to uh, successfully find the relative entropy minimum region as shown by this cross. So here I switch. And I just say we have five minutes left uh, in the questions. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So, as we saw, I, I was able to reproduce some points on this relative entropy diagram. This is just to show how the Frenetic calculation method works to complement the relative entropy uh, calculation uh, 
in this case with hard Hamiltonian switch and how a soft Hamiltonian switch, which I will introduce later, uh, also finds the minimum in just one uh, single simulation with a few iterations uh, for uh, optimization of the parameters. So this is the soft Hamiltonian switch, but I'm going to, just to keep my time, I'm going to switch um, through it. Uh, it is the intermediate version of it. So it has the same problem, which we saw with the hard one, similar problem. Uh, but there is another way of doing it. And uh, the way is to introduce a coupling term between uh, fine detail representation and coarse grain representation and uh, splitting this coupling term into two terms uh, multiplied by different lambda dependent functions. One can do pooling of coarse grain representation towards the center of masses of the groups of atoms in uh, fine detail uh, or otherwise, vice versa, depending on the on where in the lambda range we are. And this way, uh, I avoid that black hole or ideal gas problem I mentioned before. So here I will show now you a video how it helps the aggregation problem. Um, let me just move it a little bit so I can start it. Okay, so in this simulation, I start with the randomized uh, configuration of SDS surfactants uh, in water. Water is skipped uh, for clarity. And when you see that the configuration doesn't change much, it is a uh, fine detail, full atom representation. And then gradually it goes to coarse grain and then everything moves much quicker. In this simulation, uh, the micellization, proper aggregation of the of the micelle, uh, happens within two nanoseconds of effective molecular dynamics time due to coupling with coarse grain representation. I can speed it up, of course. And I think maybe I don't know if we could maybe jump to your conclusion slide if you have one yes. because we are really out of time and then we won't have time for questions. Wait a second, I can, yeah, but change the way the view. Uh, yes. <clears throat> where we have we were? Okay, basically, okay, yes, basically, uh, I could compare Martini with Cheshire model. And I mean, there is a whole Cheshire Cats Green procedure developed for this. And if we compare Martini, there are much more discrepancies with Martini model if we're simulating a lipid bilayer. Uh, so it's not Martini time, it's quarantine time. But with the Cheshire model, I have much better uh, correspondence with United Atom uh, simulation. Uh, I skip the video in interscale where I I have agile Cheshire model, meaning that iterations for optimization are going on during the simulation. I have also similar result. Uh, it's also possible to apply the technique to DPD uh, representing Lena Jones or, or vice versa. And essentially we are working on doing this step now. And after that, I just want, would like to acknowledge my peers and uh, especially uh, the group, uh, uh, the group leader, Elin, and um, another person in Hutry Center, uh, Richard Anderson, who supported this research through Hutry Center project and also CCP5 support, and other my colleagues and uh, support from SCARF and Archer HPC facilities. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I would be ready to. Thank you. Thank join. you very much for this talk. And uh, I think I can already show you a question here. And... Uh, Should I stop sharing, by the way? Yes. Uh, uh, actually, I think uh, people can now see uh, Yes, people can now see uh, the question. So how do you map the coarse grain model back to the atomic model on the fly on in the MD simulations? 
Okay, but the mapping, everything is done in Deal Poly package right now. Uh, the mapping I'm using is very similar to Martini, but uh, after a few, a few unsuccessful attempts with DOPC lipid, for instance, Martini model uh, actually has a bit too bulky beads. So when I map it uh, onto my United Atom uh, configuration, I have quite a few uh, overlaps between beads because again, when you run pure Martini stimulation, there are no overlaps because it is equilibrating with respect to itself. But if you try to map it directly on the center of masses, there will be overlaps. So I had to introduce my own model with 16 beads, which goes much better. And then if comparing those two models, I see that Martini actually overestimates Sigma and essentially it overestimates two times Epsilon as well. So there is a lot of cancellation of error going on with Martini. Thank you. And Otello, did this answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Then in the interest of time, let's thank Andre again for the nice talk. And uh, we can uh, continue to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So... Um, How do I leave? <laughs> yes, so the next speaker is Nirvana Caballero. Mm -hmm. Yes, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. My name is Nirvana Caballero. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Geneva. And I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference and for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you how are we using the framework of disorder elastic systems along with high performance computing techniques to study collective cell migration. And the philosophy behind our work is that Emergent structures can arise in very diverse systems independently of the microscopical details of the systems and in scales ranging from nanometers to kilometers. And between these emergent structures, we can find interfaces. Interfaces are nothing more than a region of a system where the system changes from one homogeneous state to a different one. And it's important to study these objects because they give us information about the whole system by just observing a small part of them. This is a, a growing colony of cells. This is a 2D tissue moving uh, over a substrate. And we can define the interface as the boundaries of the colony. And one of the most powerful tools that we have available to study um, interfaces is the framework of disorder elastic systems. Of course, this framework is not only uh, to study uh, epithelial cells. Yeah. It can be uh, applicable to other systems as ferromagnetic thin films. For example, here I show three examples. Uh, this is a growing colony of cells. This is a ferromagnetic thin film where the magnetization in black is pointing outside the screen and in gray is pointing inside the screen and the interface is the region of the system where the magnetization changes smoothly from one preferential, preferential direction to the other one. And as I was saying, this framework of disorder elastic systems is very powerful, but it's a brutal simplification of the system. So to use it, we just need to define a function that describes the position of the interface as a function of space and time. And this is brutal because we ignore all the internal degrees of freedom that the interface could have. But at the same time, it's very powerful because it allows us to extract a lot of information about the system. And in particular, it allows us to do very precise analytical calculations. And one has to assume that the interface is smooth and univalid. One of the most simplest equations that describe how an interface will evolve as a function of time is the so-called quenchet edward wilkinson equation. And according to this equation, the dynamics of these objects will be the result of the competition of only a few ingredients. The elasticity that tends to flatten the interface, some pinning force that can be present due to disorder, 
an external force that can be applied to the system. So in the case of a ferromagnetic thin film, this can be an external magnetic field that is applied to the system and thermal fluctuations. This is a very simple equation, but already it gives us a very rich phenomena. And in particular, what we can learn from this equation is that the geometry and velocity of interfaces are intrinsically related. And one of the most powerful observables that we have to study and characterize the geometry of interfaces is the roughness function. Is this B of R here, that it's nothing more than the correlations of the quadratic displacements of the function describing the position of the interface. And as I was saying, this framework allows us to do very precise analytical calculations. So in the case, of an interface that only uh, evolves as a result of the competition between elasticity and temperature. If we start from a flat initial condition and we solve numerically how um, this interface will evolve, we start from a flat initial condition and as time passes, this interface will become rougher and rougher because the elasticity will try to flatten the interface, and then we have the thermal fluctuations that will induce roughness in, the, in our interfaces. So in continuous lines, I show uh, the computation of the roughness for the uh, simulated interfaces, and I compare with our analytical prediction in dashed lines. So I show that we have a very good agreement showing that um, the calculations that we can do in this framework are very precise. But now let me tell you why are we so interested in this observable, in this roughness function. Here I show two examples of simulated interfaces. In dashed lines, I only consider elasticity and temperature. And in continuous lines, I show elasticity, temperature, and pinning. So we can already see that there are some similarities, but also there are some differences in the roughness. So at uh, large length scales, this function is an horizontal line reflecting the fact that the interface was initially flat. At short scales, the roughness function follows a very well-defined power law with an exponent that we know that we can compute analytically and numerically. And analytically, it's not only this way in which can be computed, there are other methods that can be used. But also, if we now pay attention to the system with disorder, now there is a second power law with a different exponent that uh, reflects the fact that there is pinning on uh, our system. So the idea is that we can observe the roughness uh, of, a, of an interface and try to identify which are the main mechanisms that control the dynamics and the statics of the system. So that's the idea behind, this, uh, behind our study. So this is, again, a growing colony of cells. These are epithelial cells. This is a 2D tissue that is moving over a substrate. So these are uh, in vitro assays. And we uh, studied how the interface of the growing colonies of cell was evolving as a function of time, starting from a flat initial condition. Uh, so my colleagues at the University of Zurich and Geneva did these experiments and they studied very, very long uh, interfaces for over three days, for, for many days. And we were able to analyze the roughness of interfaces. So the fronts, they, they studied fronts under five different conditions, one over for control conditions and four different inhibitors to probe different interactions acting on the colony. Um, each experiment was repeated three times. Images were taken every four hours for three days. And each front has seven centimeters with a 0.8 micro micrometer resolution. So this is an example of an extracted interface for one of the experiments under control conditions. And our interfaces are very long. We have two to the power 16 uh, pixels. 
to analyze. And uh, we computed the roughness of these uh, interfaces. To compute the roughness, this is a factorial time complexity problem. So what I did was I implemented a CUDA C++ code in-house to compute the roughness. And this allows, allowed us to study the roughness of all these data uh, in reasonable times. So here I show the example of how a roughness for um, this interface looks like. And I show the roughness for the three different realizations of the experiment and in continuous lines, the average roughness over the three realizations. And this is how the roughness looks like for the experiments under control conditions. We start from a flat initial condition and the first roughness that we obtain is after four hours. And then we follow this here in this plot, I show the roughness for over 40 hours. And we are already by eye, we can see that there is a very well-defined power law at short scales of the typical cell size. And then it's also remarkable that we can see that there is an horizontal part at large land scales, reflecting the fact that the interface was initially flat. So, but then to see if there was another kind of uh, power law reflecting other interactions in the colony, we did the following analysis. We took the roughness function, we fixed an initial position um, to uh, start a fit with a power law. And we also fixed, uh, fixed a window size in equivalent, uh, of equivalent size uh, in a logarithmic scale. And we did the fit of the data with a power law and we computed the roughness of the fit through R square. And we did the analysis of, for different values of RA and uh, WI. And this is how the goodness of the fit looks like. Um, I have to emphasize that the goodness of the fit is close to one if the function is very well fitted with a power law, and if not, it will be lower. And here in yellow, we can see that there is a um, very high value of R square for uh, large length scales reflecting the fact that we were um, starting the front from a flat initial condition. And then at short scales, we also have a maxima reflecting the fact that what we could see already by eye, and it's that at short length scales uh, of the size of a typical cell size, we can uh, fit very well the roughness with a power law. But then we found another maxima uh, at intermediate scales. It's around uh, four cells distance and expanding over uh, five cells. There is a this second region where we can fit the roughness very well with the second power law. So um, we studied different cases, as I said, to probe how different interactions affect the roughness of a colony. Uh, so we have information about how to model these systems. That was the whole question. Um, my colleagues put different drugs, uh, colchicin that targets cell division rates, cytokalacin B that inhibits cell motility and transmission of mechanical forces, meclofenamic acid that disrupts uh, electrochemical signal transmission, that means that disrupts cell, some uh, types of cell-cell communication, force calling that globally affects the cell metabolism. And we studied, for example, first the dynamics of the, of the cell colonies. And we, when we compute the average colony depth as a function of time, we see that in green, there, is, there are the results for the control conditions. And we see that different drugs really change how the dynamics of the cell fronts behave. In particular, I would like to emphasize that cytokalacin B and colchicin decrease the front velocity. 
This was somehow expected because one of the inhibitors target cell division rates and the other inhibits cell motility. So there was nothing surprising about that. But what was surprising is that, for example, metlofenamic acid and forscolin increase the front velocity. And in particular for metlofenamic acid, that we are interrupting certain type of cell-cell communication. And with that, the front uh, goes faster. Uh, but also, we could analyze um, the roughness function of the cell fronts under different inhibitors. And in particular, we analyzed what happens with the roughness in these two regions that we identified. Of course, in all cases, we see at large length scales this horizontal roughness that reflects the fact that the interfaces were all uh, flat initially. And we fit with the power law these two regions that we identify with the method I just described. And in particular here, I will focus on only two cases of the inhibitors, but we analyzed all of them. Uh, in green, I show um, the roughness exponent, the power law exponent for uh, region one and region two. And I also show in purple uh, what we observe for metrophenamic acid and in blue for cytokalacin B. And in the three cases that I show here, we see that the two regions have very different uh, roughness exponents, but they are not very, in particular at short uh, length scales, which are of the uh, typical size of a cell, uh, we don't see many variations of the roughness exponent. We see a roughness exponent, which is 0.6. But then what is remarkable that this three, in the second region, we see a much lower roughness exponent. And there is not much evolution as a function of time when uh, the interfaces evolve. And of course, we can also measure, besides of the power law, we can measure the prefactor of the roughness exponent. The prefactor is something that is increasing as a function of time. And this is a measure of how the um, interfaces become rougher to the, the prefactor uh, of the power law. Already by I, we can see that in the four cases that I show here, the um, interfaces look very different. But with the roughness, we can characterize how different are these um, fronts. And we see that um, the interfaces become rougher as time passes in both regions, in region one that I'm showing uh, on my left, and in region two that I'm showing on my right. And we see that there is an evolution of the roughness. So. Uh, and we also see that those fronts that go faster become rougher too. So um, we, our idea is to try to find a proper model uh, to model what, which are the main interactions that are present and co are controlling how cells migrate. So one of the most common uh, models in the literature is the so-called vertex model. So in this model, we consider that cells are composed of, of six vertex and it's based on energy minimization. And we, we consider that uh, each cell has a preferred cell area, which is something that we can measure in average for because we have the images in our experiments. Uh, and we have to define the elasticity, which was uh, chosen to reproduce mechanical properties in other works, not in our work. We have a preferred cell perimeter and a line tension along cell-cell junctions. And we again can reproduce the experimental protocol with this uh, model. We start from a regular initial condition. Uh, so we have the uh, and a flat yeah. interface. Nirvana, maybe I'd just like to remind you that uh, if you wanted to have five minutes for your questions, then you have no more time. Ah, OK, yes. So I will just say that with this simple model, we couldn't reproduce. We obtained the roughness function of these interfaces. And we, could, of course, at short length scales, since we don't have any fluctuations, we were not expecting to have a power law. 
But in the second region where in, we observed a second power law in the experiments, with this kind of model, we couldn't reproduce such, such uh, low roughness exponents. So this means that we need other models and we're working on them to, to try to find uh, the same roughness that we observed for the experiments. And with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators and I let you with the conclusions and I will be happy to answer your questions if there are some. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. And um, I, I would like to see if there are any questions. Uh, I do not see any questions at the moment and we are quite out of time. So I, I would maybe suggest that if somebody has questions, you could chat directly to uh, Nirvana and you can find her in the people in the session, for example, and then write a personal chat or in any other way you can contact her uh, by searching overall in the in the meeting uh, participant list. So I, I really suggest to get in touch with her. And uh, then in the interest of time, I would like to continue with the next speaker, Francois Sicard, who is at uh, UCL. Yes, uh, let me share my screen. The... Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Adina. Um, so what I would like to uh, discuss today, if you, can, if you can see my screen, is uh, the way we can use um, droplet or emulsion droplet as a kind of smart system to perform a specific mechanism that can be useful for, um, oops, I lost it. Yeah, for, um, for, I would say biological or industrial um, purposes, like uh, as I will discuss, some mimicking uh, cell fragmentation or something that can be used in in three D uh, in three D printing, or um, some some system that could be used like a drug delivery system or, or encapsulation of of pathogens, and this is the two the two topics I will uh, discuss. Um, in this in this talk. So before going any further, I mean into into uh, the technical details, I will just spend a few minutes just to remind you the the system that I'm using. Uh, so basically, they're uh, droplets uh, made of I mean emulsion droplet, and like like you might uh, know quite well uh, when you use cream or butter when you have oil in water or, or water in oil. Uh, emulsion. So, um, and importantly, uh, what we want to do is to study the formation of the system and uh, most of all the stability of the system. So, to make this this, this system uh, be stable, actually, we can use a uh, different type of, of emulsifier. So, we can use uh, surfactant, polymers, but we can also use solid particles, which is uh, what we call, I mean, a pickering emulsion and what I'm interested in in this talk. And pickering emulsion actually, even if it's quite old, because it comes from, I mean, uh, the work of pickering in, in 1907, it's still quite a hot topic in the field because of a lot of interesting application in drug delivery, cosmetic, foodstuff, water waste treatment and energy. So um, to achieve some kind of understanding of, of this system, actually, because we need to study the, the droplet and, and the stabilizer of this droplet, the um, scale I will be uh, focusing on is a, a mesoscale uh, and mesoscale simulation with a specific mesoscopic dynamic simulation, which is called DPD for dissipative particle dynamics. And in a nutshell, actually, uh, what a DPD uh, framework is actually just a mesoscopic uh, Lagrangian simulation method, which is based on coarse grained uh, elementary units. So here is just a representation of this coarse graining where one bead in the simulation can uh, gather between three, four, five water molecules. And then we have to uh, feed the system accordingly when we have something else. Than the, than the water molecule. So everything in, in, in DPD simulation or basically is controlled with uh, the interaction between speeds, which is a short range uh, repulsive force, which is supposed to uh, mimic uh, everything like the Van der Waals and uh, hydrogen bonds interaction between the bits. 
And, and very interestingly, actually, and that's one of the, the strong points of DPD is that uh, the mean field hydrodynamic equations of DPD, they can recover the Navier-Stokes equation in the continuum limit. So that's, that's a, a real pros when you use that system and with respect to other coarse grain, a coarse grain system, because here the hydrodynamic effect are well described to, to some extent. And these uh, actually makes DPD very, very useful for a different type of system, like uh, when you want to study DNA, when you want to study uh, membrane interaction of specific, uh, could be nanomaterial with the membrane, uh, to study the, the um, collective dynamics of surfactant and, and also study uh, colloids. But in this, uh, in this presentation, I will, uh, as I said, focus on something more specific, which is uh, the formation, stability, and the formation of, of droplet in solvent. So here is just an example of water droplet in organic solvent. Uh, and you can't see the organic solvent for clarity, but what you can see in pink, so the pink beads, which are blue here, actually, uh, those are the water molecule. Uh, and in this representation, one water bead uh, um, consist in a uh, four water molecule, and those water droplets actually stabilize with solid particles that you can see here, which are made also of beads in this uh, DPD representation. And here is the type of nanoparticle I, I will be using in, uh, in the following. So they could be either uh, homogeneous nanoparticle that you can see on the left, and it's homogeneous because this nanoparticle is made of hydrophilic and hydrophobic beads, or it can be a genus particle, which is the one on the right, which is half hydrophilic and half hydrophobic. And for each nanoparticle, because they evolve at the interface of the water droplet, one uh, parameter we use to describe their uh, stability or thermodynamic property or wettability is their contact angle. And just um, uh, to say that this contact angle actually is uh, give the maximal stability of the system when it's close to 90 degree, which is mean that the system of the particle can interact um, with the water and the, the organic solvent in this case in an equilibrium way. So <clears throat> based on this introduction that we're interested in uh, droplets mm -hmm. and the stability of those droplets, let's see now what kind of mechanism we, we can study uh, through these uh, mesoscopic framework. And the first one I want to, to show or discuss a bit is what can we understand from fragmentation or self-division of uh, one, uh, one uh, droplet. And this is particularly interesting because droplets or emulsion droplets are well known to be a very good candidate to study some kind of biological mechanism because they can reproduce the, mechan the, the division mechanism of, of protocells. So this is a work, I mean, which has been published in 2017 from uh, a different group. And actually in this simulation, they were studying, a, they were using a continuous model to study uh, the division of the self-division of, of water droplet. But in no case, we'll use uh, some kind of mesoscopic approach will give us some uh, kind of information or different kind of information regarding this mechanism. And actually, so of course, because it's a mesoscopic model, we are limited in size with what we can study. But I mean, uh, with some uh, understanding, we can uh, try to extrapolate this kind of information that we can get at a larger scale. So what we've done, actually, is to study this self-fragmentation or self-division mechanism. I mean, there's no external uh, stimuli uh, letting this mechanism happen. It's more like it's internal energy of the system which let the, the water droplet fragment. You can imagine that there could be, in terms of biology, there could be some, some ATP molecule inside the system, inside the cell, and this will drive the division of that cell. Uh, in all cases, actually, to mimic this, there's no real ATP molecule or real energy inside the water droplet. It's more like we will use an end sampling technique like metadynamics or umbrella sampling and a specific collective variable to reproduce that mechanism. And what we've done, actually, is just to reproduce this self fermentation mechanism in the bare case, so without any... Um, armor around the droplet and try to reproduce or analyze, compare this kind of division when the, the droplet is stabilized with two different type of, genus, of nanoparticle, one which is genus and one which is homogeneous, which means that the chemistry of the nanoparticle is different. And what we've measured and, and discussed actually is that, well, if this uh, energy is the, the free energy 
which follows the, the, the division of the droplet, and n c is the number of contact between what? Between the mother droplet and the daughter droplet, then we can measure exactly how much energy you need to fragment this system. So imagine that here is the number of contact between the two. It starts at a certain number, and then uh, the, the droplet progressively fragments to end up with a mother and a daughter. And what we see is that if we measure this energy when the droplet is stabilized with genus particle or with homogeneous particle, then we see a clear difference in the energy you need to give to the system internally to get this uh, fragmentation mechanism happen. So we did measure actually the difference that we have between the, the energy we have when the system is a bare system and when the system is coated. And actually, this is the order of magnitude of the energy we measured. I mean, we can give this, I mean, we related this in terms of ATP uh, molecule energy, just to say maybe in a real system, a biological system, that's something we might uh, think about. Uh, but also, we realized that there were two different, uh, also a difference in energy between the division when the droplet is stabilized with genus or homogeneous particle. And actually, this difference in energy can be well explained by the fact that when you use genus particle, which is half hydrophilic and half hydrophobic, then there's a preferential orientation of the nanoparticle at the interface, which means that here we have more flexibility when we use homogeneous particle to let the system fragment. And this has a cost in terms of, of fragmentation energy. And the other thing we've checked, and which is completely independent of the, the DPD uh, simulation, is the difference between the Gibbs free energy we might measure for the fragmentation when we don't take into account the surface, um, the, the Torman correction, which is an effect of curvature, and the one we have in the real simulation. So, this uh, formula is the dashed line, and the bold line is the one we get from the simulation. And, and if we compare these two energy, the, the dashed line and the bold line, actually we can have we can measure the value of the Tolman length, which can also be measured from, from experiment. And actually we end up with a value of delta, which is very close to the original value proposed by Tolman in his um, original paper. So and we were quite happy to have this value, to double check this value just because this is independent of DPD simulation, and that would assess a bit more the value for this Tolman correction. So another effect I want to discuss very, um, very quickly is um, and another mechanism we can achieve with, with the water droplet in an organic solvent or organic droplet in water solvent is their ability to encapsulate and release a payload under flow condition. So this kind of mechanism, something will be encapsulated inside the droplet and maybe release under uh, shear stress, as you can get when you have an occlusion in, a, in an artery. So the, the original idea actually uh, for this work started from the fact that when you have water droplet or droplet stabilized with nanoparticle, you might have a transition at the interface between something which is elastic to something which becomes more rigid for the interface when the volume of the system changes. And because this interface can become rigid, you can start forming some kind of weird shape. And eventually, you can even form some kind of pocket-like shape. And actually, this is uh, uh, something we did check originally in, in 2017, uh, where we were just considering water molecule using DPD simulation and then removing artific uh, artificially water molecule from, from the system, and just to see if mimicking evaporation, we could observe the formation of crotch like shape. And actually, we did observe a difference between genus particle and homogeneous particle, because Genus particle as such that it's high hydroph half, uh, half hydrophilic and half hydrophobic and has a preferential orientation, then we have the formation of this pocket-like shape. In the case of homogeneous, we don't have the pocket-like shape formation, and we can observe the evaporation of the operation, the release, I would say, of the, of the armoring nanoparticle. Then we decided to go a bit further um, into, into uh, this investigation and say, okay, we have nanoparticle, but the thing which is very easy to do when you have a system like that is to change the properties of the nanoparticle. I mean, change the chemistry or change the size of the nanoparticle that will coat the droplet. And actually that's what we did, considering first the um, uniformly covered nanopart uh, droplet, half uh, small nanoparticle, half big nanoparticle, and the sandwich-like droplet. And if you follow the same kind of, of procedure, when we let the system evaporate, the water molecule inside evaporate, you can 
quite easily end up with some very specific shape, which is like this pocket-like shape or this double pocket-like shape for the system. And this visually looks like very, very interesting in terms of encapsulating or fitting something inside when you know that you can play with the chemistry of the nanoparticle. But before going to this encapsulation thing, what we, the question we tried to answer was, OK, I've got that pocket-like system, and this is the side, side view of the system, so you can't see the pocket, but it's inside. What would happen if this is inside a shear flow, like you might have in your artery? And I agree, this is what we study. Like This is the original system starting here, and we imposed different shear rate, increasing the shear rate from the green to the red. So here is the, we reach the equilibration of the flow, which corresponds to a shear flow. And then we stop or we stop the, the shear rate and let the system relax. And we follow two different things. First, the, center, the velocity of the center of mass of the system and also the relative shape and isotropy of the system, which is a good indicator of the change in shape. And what we observe actually is that we could get different kind of shape, which are stable even after we, re we, we stop the shear rate. And this stability actually can be explained by the fact that there is a jam distribution of the, of the nanoparticle at the interface. So the stronger the shear rate, the more tricky the, the, the configuration could be. But because of this jam organization, we might end up with a metastable system with different shape, depending on the original shear stress we applied. And of course, the final question to, to, to the final answer to this question would be, OK, you've got a pocket like uh, system. Maybe you can encapsulate something in that system, exactly what we did with this pink uh, solute inside the pocket. And how would the system react under the shear, the, the shear stress? So what we did is simply to consider two different sizes. So a small one and a big one, apply the exact same shear stress I discussed before, just to see what could happen. And what we see is that depending on the size, we might get something, we might get a better encapsulation of the system, or we might obtain the expulsion or the release of the solute when the, when the system evolved. Which is quite good because if you think in terms of of drug delivery or, or pathogen encapsulation, you can easily work with both of these of these uh, mechanism depending on the size of what you want to encapsulate and the size of the pocket. So to end up with this, this discussion, actually the, the thing is, because we have the droplet that can be uh, armor with nanoparticle and those nanoparticles can be functionalized, the thing is that you can functionalize them in such a way that they can be better at targeting something, they can have better responsiveness to external stimuli, or they can also be active in terms of propulsion of the system. And that's why we can talk about some kind of soft nanorobot to, to deliver drugs or to encapsulate pathogens. And, and just uh, to illustrate this kind of thing is that if you consider this original system, which are on this left uh, part of the picture, in a shear rate, which is not too strong, and if you start increasing the shear rate, what you might observe is maybe this kind of system or evolution when the, the solute might be released from the pocket. And because in an artery, when there's an occlusion, you have an increase in the shear rate first be before having something which is more, uh, more tricky, you might imagine that this system might be able to release a specific drug when there is a specific occlusion in an artery. And with this, I'd like to, to thank you for your, for your attention. I'd like to thank also my, my collaborators, uh, Ron and, and Alberto, uh, with, this, uh, with this work. And I'd like to thank the Archer uh, team.